Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you all here today. We've got like a, a polar opposite today going on. Everybody is out in the wings, and we've got a few that are sitting in the middle, but that's awesome. Uh, it just makes me work a little bit uh, differently. That's all. You have to focus on the outsides. But anyways, uh, yeah, that's when the brain just kind of moves and goes, and you just have to deal with it, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here today. Isn't it a great day to be in the house of the Lord? That was mostly pretty good. Way to go. Um, I'm excited about today, and I hope that you are too, because I believe that it is one of the best things that we can do is when we gather as a church body and worship together. And I am so glad that you are here today. We have a uh, few things that I just want to update you on and communicate with you about. Uh, a couple of those things are we always have a digital connection card that is available for you to fill out online today. You can scan the QR code and it'll take you directly to the location to fill out that digital connection card. It's easy, it's simple, and you can do it right now if you would like to. Uh, we also have that uh, our digital giving or online giving is uh, there as well. So uh, thank you for continuing to uh, give to the Ministry of Living Hope. You are so generous and it is awesome for us to worship God in that way. And if you uh, brought in maybe a check or a, t or a cash today for tithes and offerings, we have a box that's located in the back that you can easily place that in. And uh, that's a, a great way for you to do that. Um, other things, just a re general reminder that we haven't talked about recently, but we want to just make sure everybody knows about it, is that we have a thing called Steeps and Sweets that we do every, typically every uh, Sunday morning at about 9.15 to 9.45. It's just a way for us to be in community together, and we love it when you come in early. And uh, maybe you're not a coffee drinker or a tea drinker, or you just uh, want to hang out with people. That's a great way to do that. Come early and chat with people, get to know others. That would be awesome. Uh, we've been talking over the last couple of weeks about a thing that is called a, uh, it's a next gen service project. And so it's for our kids and their families that are uh, basically from about preschool to fifth grade. And it's an opportunity for them to do some projects and serve our community. Part of it is happening right here in the church, and part of it is uh, serving the people, the staff at Nixon Elementary. And we sent out an email and a Facebook post last week and uh, communicating all about it. And there's some opportunities for the church to give towards this. And so we would love it if you would uh, check those emails or check that Facebook post and uh, go to the Sign Up Genius because we got about one week left to donate items for the project. And we really need your help to get this uh, kind of taken care of. So if you have any questions, you can ask me or you can ask Andrea Brown. And we would love to uh, help about answering any questions that you may have about that. This Wednesday is a big Wednesday with Hope Kids uh, that's the and the Parents Life Group, and then also Youth Ministry meets this Wednesday. So uh, kids and families and everybody, uh, make sure that you are aware of what's going on. And say that you are interested in being a part of a life group. We would love to connect you with that. And so if there is an opportunity for us to do that, please let us know. Let me know. I would love to connect you with any life group that you would like to be a part of so that you can continue to grow in your relationship. We have found that life groups and community such as that is a great way for us to be spurred on by one another. And we believe that that saying that passage of scripture that says iron sharpens iron. We do that together. And so we take that seriously and we'd love for you to be a part of that as well. Today, uh, we will not be having a uh, children's church today. So kids, you're with us today and you're going to enjoy every minute of it. So uh, I'm certain that you will. So uh, let's take a moment and let's just spend some time with God in prayer this morning as, as we get going, as we uh, do worship together. Father God, we are so very grateful that you love us the way that you do. You are a gracious God that continues to um, make your face shine upon us. 
And you have blessed us in so many great ways. We can't fathom how amazing you are. It's beyond our understanding, God. And I find that to be both uh, hard to understand and easy to understand at the same time. Because God, it would be very easy for us to say, yes, God, you are a God of great blessing and uh, amazing provision and protection and all of that. But God, the way that you do it is just beyond my understanding. And I think that's the case for all of us. We, we get it, but at the same point in time, it's so beyond us because you love us so very much. And you are a great God. And we are so amazed by your provision and your work in us. God, I, I know that today when we arrive here at church, when we do anything, we are burdened by a number of things. There's burdens that we have for our families and for our work and for our community and for people that are in our lives and our own situations that are all around us at the same time. Lord, there are medical things that are overwhelming us and there are just um, concerns. And God, we want to bring those to you. So whatever it is that is overwhelming us, we just want to lay them down at your feet and ask God that you would work in these things. Whether it be concerns about our medical future, a surgery that's coming up, like in the case of Barry, we ask God that you would work in amazing ways. Be with the doctors and the surgeons and the medical staff that will be attending to him in the coming weeks. God, will you just work in that situation? For those of us that are mourning because of the loss of a loved one, like Kathy Montgomery and the loss of her nephew this week, God, will you just provide comfort in ways that are just overwhelming to us because of your great love for us? And Lord, I know that there are others that, that continue to grieve and continue to mourn because of the loss of their loved ones, whether it be in the last month, six months, year or years, God, you continue to provide comfort in our grief. And we know that to be true because you love us so very much that you would send your son Jesus to die on a cross for us. You provided a way for salvation for us. And God, we are so amazed at that. Let us not forget the power of your love and the grace that you offer us. That we can live our lives to glorify you, but we can also live and pursue you and pursue holiness. So God... In all of that, will you guide us? Will you protect us? And, and allow us to hear your word today and to get to the very message that you want to communicate to us today according to your word and your power. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Something that I forgot to mention is that uh, over the next two weeks, we're going to have a couple of uh, special guests. Uh, next week, we have a, uh, a guest speaker that is um, going to be sharing about their work in another country. And so we want to uh, invite you and make sure that you are here for that. Uh, last week, we had a, a guest speaker and we didn't have live stream. And we're still figuring out if we need to uh, cancel the live stream this week. We'll uh, communicate that with you in the next couple of days. Uh, um, but that is happening next week. And then the following week, we have uh, Pastor Tim Purcell, who will be coming to uh, our church from uh, Charles City, Iowa. And he is our uh, our area district assistant district superintendent. He's got a really long title now, and I continue to uh, mess it up. But uh, he'll be sharing with us. And you don't want to miss when Pastor Tim is here, because not only is, is he a great communicator, but he just loves you all and loves our church and loves being a part of it when he comes to visit. So you don't want to miss that. Um, and so make sure that you're here over the next couple of weeks, because we've got some really cool opportunities uh, for us um, in the next couple of weeks. How many times can I say in the next couple of weeks, you want to be here, okay? Over the, yeah, stop it. 
We are continuing on with our sermon series that is uh, titled Jesus Journey from the Manger to the Cross. And uh, we're just jumping right back into it. We're kind of picking up where we left off. And today, if you want to open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, that would be great. You can turn over your, uh, your Bible. You can open up your, your uh, cell phone and turn on your Bible app. But we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 18. We're looking at a passage of scripture that is directly right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, a passage of scripture that is looking at three different subjects that you don't want to miss, and they are the subjects of giving, prayer, and fasting. Important subjects as we, uh, as we uh, think about it. So let's jump in. Let's get to reading. We're going to read Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. And if you want to, you can join me with this. This would be fine. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we for have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Very good. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only in your father, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So as we think about this, this, this is a, a lengthy passage of scripture. There's a lot in here and I will be very honest. We are not going to talk about every single um, aspect of this passage of scripture. Um, a couple of things and reasons why is because there's a lot. And I've got one week to be able to really unpack some of the big picture ideas and the big picture thoughts in here. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time breaking things down one by one. But a couple of things that I do want to communicate to you is that just because just because um, this passage of scripture is so lengthy doesn't mean that we ignore it. So there's a lot that I want to just uh, address and talk about. A um, couple of contextual issues that I want to note is that these 18 verses should be considered, uh, could be considered to be the center or the height or the, uh, the thrust of the whole Sermon on the Mount. If we were to uh, take the whole thing together, I think that these, these 18 verses are really a pinnacle of the uh, of the entire Sermon on the Mount. And if we combine verses, uh, chapters five, six, and seven, this would be like the, the top of the mountain if we were to compare it that way. And these 18 verses should kind of be read together because verse one is the heading of the entire section. 
And verse 1 says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And, and this verse outlines the primary point regarding all three subjects, which is giving, praying, and fasting. And so what Jesus is trying to communicate based on that is that when it comes to your, uh, your righteousness, these are the ways that you want to kind of focus on it in these three specific ways. And so he's really kind of setting us up for the big picture and the primary, primary point. We're going to unpack more of that in a little bit. The second part of why this is really important is that each section repeats two critical statements related to true worship. Uh, the first one is found in uh, chapter or verse two, verse five and 16, where it talks about that they have received their reward. When people are doing things for the sake of others to see them, they are receiving their reward. And Jesus repeats that a couple of times. And he's indicating that that is false worship. They're doing it for the wrong purpose. The second is found in verses 4, 6, and 18, where it talks about the Father rewarding us. So we have this one section that is uh, repeated to, uh, multiple times, and it's talking about false worship. And then he's talking about uh, a couple other things that are more pure worship that are focused in on what God sees and what God does in us. And that is God-centered worship, not hypocritical. And hypocritical in this sense is the going through the motions of worship. Last textual or contextual thing that we want to address is that it seems that Jesus is not uh, really focusing in on an exhaustive spiritual discipline. And focus on, on that. But what he is really doing is he is training new covenant hearts how to commune with God. So these three aspects, giving, prayer, and fasting, Jesus is training these new disciples on how our hearts are to commune with God. And he's doing it in very concise and simple ways. So as we look at the whole passage, we're going to try our best to not isolate the three sections, but we're going to try to keep them combined as much as possible. Are you with me? Excellent, because this is, this is a lot, okay? Um, and so I'm hoping that we can kind of get the big picture, 30,000 foot type of view of what God, what Jesus is trying to communicate to us, all right? First thing is this is there's two things that I really, wanna, I really want you to catch, and then hopefully we can get to some application and really drive home the purpose. First is this, is that practicing righteousness is what Jesus is talking about. Practicing righteousness. What he's not talking about is that if you do these things, you, righteousness will be ascribed to you. It's not talking about that if you, your actions and your actions will, someone else will say that you are righteous because of that, but we have been made righteous and made right with God because of our relationship with him. And so it's the process of us being involved in righteousness. Do you see the difference between that? Because what we're really dealing with is that we have been made righteous in our relationship with God. And so we practice opportunities or we practice the way to be able to live out that by participating in giving, prayer, and fasting. It's not that if we do these things, we will be. See the difference? Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, there was an introduction to righteousness where Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And then in chapter, or verse, chapter 5, verse 20, it says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly 
not enter the kingdom of heaven. And this theme of righteousness continues to be a theme throughout the Sermon on the Mount. And we can see that this is an instruction for Jesus on how to live our lives in communion with God. And it's how to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, worthy of the kingdom of God and the good news of the kingdom of Jesus. And where we get this big picture from is that it's a contrast to the way in which the Jewish leaders of the day were behaving and how they practiced their righteousness three times. In these 18 verses, Jesus talks about the hypocrites and, and how they were behaving and how they were acting and what they were doing and what was common practice of the day. And it's not too far of a stretch on when Jesus says the hypocrites who he was talking about. You see, what they would do is when they would give to the needy, they would announce it with trumpets on the streets and in the synagogues. Now, was that literal? Don't know. But what we do know is that when people gave, they made sure that others saw that they were giving and gave lavishly because of others. The second thing is, is that when they prayed, they did so loudly and babbling, meaning that they just droned on and on 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 with big words and repetitious phrases. phrases. Now, if you are thinking, well, I know some people like that, and he's standing up on the stage right now, <laughs> how dare you? No, I'm just kidding, just joking. But isn't it just like people who want to be seen as religious to make a show of something. Why? Because we like the attention. And so there were, there were people, hypocrites, that prayed on the street corners, loudly making a public spectacle of it and using big fancy words and repeating phrases that sounded really, really good. And they loved that other people saw them. And then when they fasted, when they would fast, they would put ashes on their face. They would color their face with dirt and uh, burned up pieces of wood so that it would look as if they are, uh, they've been doing it for a really long time and not eating, not taking care of themselves and all of that. And Jesus is teaching the disciples, not only the disciples, but anyone that is listening that his disciples and how they will pray, how they will give, and how they will fast is not like that. See, the expectation is, is that we will give, that we will pray, and that we will fast. That's the expectation. And Jesus is saying, when you do it, he's not saying if, he's not saying if, and I want you to catch that. It's not if you give, when. It's not if you're going to pray, it's when. It's not if you fast, it's when you fast. Now, giving, praying, we get those things, don't we? Fasting, whew, that's tougher, isn't it? You see, true righteousness is this, is that it seeks the kingdom of God. True righteousness seeks the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. It doesn't live for pleasing men. It doesn't attempt to find ways to gain the favor of men or the applause of men. Righteousness is completely, completely centered on God. And Jesus is trying to communicate to us uh, because of his examples within, within this conversation uh, to help us to understand what it means to practice righteousness. He divides what is holy from what is common, from what is clean, from what is unclean, and what is evil from what is good. And he shows us that what the difference between false righteousness 
and true righteousness really is. And it all comes down to the motivation of the heart. What's going on in here? True giving. It's not done so that others can see and say something good about you. It's not done. True prayer is not done as a show for others. True fasting is not done to get the care, the comfort, or the sympathy of others. But we are to practice these things. We are to give. We are to pray. And sometimes in public. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, hold on. We're supposed to pray in our closet and... uh, not in front of other people. Well, sometimes we're supposed to pray in in public. I do. And you do as well. And I hope that you will continue. But what's the motivation behind our prayer? That's that's the 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 ticket. When we fast, what's the motivation behind the fast? And I think that when we get to that portion of it. When we get to that big picture, that makes the difference. What's the motivation of our heart? Story goes like this of a couple desperately needing a break from their mission work in in Kentucky. They needed a break. And so they decided to head to their parents' home in Washington state traveling in zero degree weather was challenging. They had a baby and uh, a partially working car heater. Upon reaching Colorado, they had only a little bit of change left, so they pulled into a parking lot to discuss what they should do about their critical financial situation. In amazement, the lady uh, of the couple said, we do what we preach, don't we? We believe the Lord and we pray. So they bowed their heads. They asked the Lord to send help for them. And when they finished praying, They started the car back up and drove to a gas station and sat there wondering what to do next. Another car pulled in behind them and a lady came, got out of the car and came running to the window. Very excitedly, she said, I saw you parked back at the grocery store with your heads bowed. I told my husband, I believe that you were Christians and that you were praying for financial assistance and I want to help you. Reaching in the window, she placed money into their hands And the couple were overwhelmed, thanked the lady, and praised God for his provision. The idea is is that we have to be willing to see the need of others and help out without any fanfare. But then at the same point in time, we have to be willing to go to the Father in prayer. Something that has to be done, not just by us, but by people for who knows how long, is that when we do something, we don't look around to see who saw me do that. Have you ever caught yourself doing that? Did something for nice, did something really nice for someone and can't wait for their praise? Come on. You wash the dishes? Waiting for a thank you, expecting it. Maybe I'm the only person here. I have done that. I've cleaned the entire kitchen waiting. Yes, praise. It always happens because she's generous. But how often have our motivations been wrong in doing something for someone else? motivations for prayer been wrong to try to convince God to do something when that's not what we do or something along those lines. The motivation of our heart has to be better than that. Better where our focus is completely on God. Why do we help? Why do we care? Why do we pray? Why do we do these things? We do them out of love for one another and we do them out of love for God, not for what we're going to get out of it. 
We've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus because he loves us and we love him. So we practice these things of righteousness and we let them live out of us because of our love for him. So we get to participate in what God is doing in the world around us. And we do that through a couple of these practices. Now, the big picture, I think, in all of this is is this last point, and it's communion with God is the big picture. This is fleshed out in God being the primary focus of everything that is going on in these 18 verses. God is mentioned around 10 times in these 18 verses, and in many things that Jesus says about him. There, here's, here's four, okay? That the Father sees in secret. The father sees what we do, and it's mentioned in verses 4 and 18. The father is the one who the disciples are to address in their prayer, and and this prayer invites everyone to collectively come to God in prayer. The our father who art in heaven. The, The motivation for prayer is the father's care. God knows our needs even before we pray and ask. God knows that's our motivation. And that's something that comes up again in Matthew chapter seven, verses seven through 11. And the last thought is, is that God in all of this wants to reward. It's said in multiple places that God wants to reward. But what we'll see in all of this is that God is the reward. It's not about what we might receive, but it's that we are participating in this with God and he is our reward. Jesus is teaching us to be so heavenly minded that anything and everything that we do is not only focused on communion with God, but has an earthly benefit. Here's what I mean by that, that giving prayer and fasting not only bring us into communion with God, not only bring us into relationship with God, but they also have an effect on others. Okay. When we give, we're not only helping those in need, but we're actually being able to show them who God is, that he is a God that meets their needs And they get a bigger picture of that, and we get to see them see that. Prayer, not only are we having that conversation with God, but we get the opportunity to bless others by praying and letting them see who God is. And when we fast, we train ourselves to long for God, not longing for the things of this earth and this world but longing for his strength, his sustenance, his energy through us. Jesus begins this section with a warning to be careful. Don't get lost. Watch out. And he's warning us against false righteousness, a false of piety that uh, chases earthly glory. But at the same time, Jesus shows us that the glory of God is the great reward when our hearts are pure. And we're reminded of this in Matthew chapter five, verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see the glory of God. Is there any greater pleasure in this world than the glory of God? And Jesus is helping the disciples and us to see and to forsake all the accolades, that's the word I was looking for, accolades of the world. And what he's communicating to us is that we don't give or we don't pray or we don't fast for the the attaboys and the applause and all of that. But it's about the communion with God our interaction with him focused on him and nothing else. All other things cease to matter. So as we bring it home today, as we kind of think about some application, what do we make of all this? Well, couple of thoughts that it's not about not giving. 
And it's not about not praying, and it's not about not fasting. Because it would be very easy for us to look at this passage of Scripture and say, well, if it's to be all done in secret, then I, shouldn't just, I should just not do it. But what we need to remember is that Jesus is saying that when you do these things. And so we have to understand the, the balance in all this is that our righteousness needs to have legs to it. Our righteousness, our, our holiness, our, our faith needs to have legs to it in order for us to grow in relationship with God. So we give so that God can work and he gets the glory. We pray so that God does what God does, not because of our prayer, but because of our relationship with him and to commune with him. And we fast so that our reliance is not on anything else. So when was the last time you fasted? I asked that question of myself this week, all week, because I have been wrestling with this passage all week. And it's been painful for me to say, I can't remember the last time I legitimately fasted well. And what I mean by that is where I made a commitment. I'm going to fast for five days uh, from this. By day two, I blew it. But he's a God of grace, right? Amen. All right, there we go. But the idea is that we need to get to the place where our motivations are not about us. And so we have to be very intentional about fighting against our human nature. Fighting against our human nature to point out a sign, to ring a bell, sound an alarm, and let everyone know what we are doing and have done and will be doing when it comes to these things, when it comes to our righteousness. If we look at Jesus' wisdom to not let our right hand, our left hand know what our right hand is doing, it's not about hiding these things, but it's doing them with the right motivation. When we, if we intentionally give, intentionally pray, intentionally fast so that everyone knows about it, we are missing the point of what these things really are, and we're missing it out. Our relationship with Jesus, our communion with God is the reason why we do these things. Because we love God, because Jesus is our Savior, this is why we give. This is why we pray. This is why we fast. So what do we need to do differently in our lives? When it comes to your practicing righteousness and your communion with God, what might you do differently to not make it about you, but about him? Because that's what Jesus is really communicating to us is that it's not about us, but it's about God. Because the hypocrites made it all about them. So we get to practice our righteousness, quote unquote. But the pointing is always to him, not to us. So what might we do differently? What I think is that we don't stop doing these things. But we adjust how we approach them. Maybe we don't put it on face, Facebook that we're going to fast for a period of time. Maybe something else. Maybe we don't tell people about our devotional time. Maybe we don't tell others about this or about that or how we gave, but we gave so that no one else would know. We gave so that uh, it's not drawing attention. I don't know. I don't know what it might be. And I wish I had some steps for us, but I don't because I think then 
then I'm solving the problem for you. And I think that that is defeating the purpose. But I think we have to figure out how we practice these things that draws attention to him, not to us. If someone else finds out, no worries. But us intentionally letting others know and saying, look at me, this is what I've done. I don't think that's the point. And anyways, the entire prayer that Jesus taught the disciples is completely focused on God and him supplying our needs and him meeting us. So it's not about us. So today, assess where you're at in your heart motivation. And ask yourself the hard question, why do I do the things I do? Is it for my relationship with God or is it for me so others see how good I am? And I think we'll be able to make a course correction if necessary. But if we don't ask ourselves the hard questions, we'll miss out on an opportunity to give God glory. So let's take some time to pray, and then we're going to continue in on our worship. So Father God, we come before you today thankful that we have Passages of scripture that challenge us. And Lord, I'm not shy enough to, to really just come before you today and just realize that, Lord, I have fallen short of these things in my own life. And I just want to acknowledge that God, thank you for revealing to me areas where I have not fulfilled you're calling for us. But God, help us to make steps. Help me to make steps in my own life where I realize that the, the ways that we participate in our righteousness, the way that we live out the, the righteousness that you have already worked in us because of our relationship with you is done not for others, but it's done for you and for God Almighty. And so, God, we just pray that you would work in each of us today, that you would help us to be reminded when our motivations, when our intentions get out of whack, where we can focus more intently on who you are and what you want to do in us more than anything else. And so thank you, God, that we get to hear this passage of scripture spoken directly from Jesus that reminds us that our relationship with you is not a show. But it's always about you and what you want to do in us. And so God help us with that. As we ask ourselves hard questions today, Lord, will you just gently remind us of your grace? We thank you for the power of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us in worship today. As, uh, as we kind of close out our time together, we're going to sing. Why don't you stand up and we'll worship together.